is the basic fighting element in armored operations. It normally functions as part of a squadron and will be called upon to conduct a variety of tasks. In the offense, as part of a combat team, the troop could be involved in the advance to contact, deliberate attacks, or high-speed exploitation and pursuit operations. In the defense, the troop may act as part of the covering force it may fight from prepared positions near or alongside the infantry, or it may be held for use as part of a blocking or counter-attack force. While holding at a hide, the combat team commander issues a warning order for occupying a defensive position. Charlie, Charlie, three. This is three. A warning order. Situation. Enemy. Platoon dug in at grid. The immediate priority for the squadron before moving into a harbor is to rearm and refuel its tanks at a running replenishment site, which is set up by the squadron's A-1 echelon. When it is ready, the squadron sergeant major informs the squadron, and the troops move through one at a time to receive fuel, ammunition, rations, and any other items requested on the previous day's administrative report. After completing its replenishment cycle, each troop drops off a harbor guide with the SSM, who will act as the harbor master. Before arriving at the harbor location, Crew commanders ensure that all radio speakers, lights, and vehicle heaters are turned off. Under direction of the harbor master, the guides meet their arriving troops at the contact point. They direct each tank into position following the track plan. After the tanks are shut down, the sentries take up their posts. Meanwhile, the guides brief their troop leaders on the harbor situation. When the last tank is in position, the troop goes on a two-minute listening silence. Once the area has been reported clear by combat team headquarters, harbor routine begins. The troop leader is responsible for the enforcement of harbor discipline, as well as ensuring the sentries are briefed, that his tanks all have interlocking arcs, and that the adjacent troops' arcs in sentry positions are coordinated with his. He also selects a nearby troop RV in case a crash harbor occurs. The troop warrant officer assists the troop leader in determining what tank repairs and replacements are required and completes the troop's ammunition, casualty, and POL states. 20 minutes after his last tank has shut down, the troop leader reports to squadron headquarters passes on his troop state to the battle captain and receives his harbor orders. The troop leader plans for the next day's operation by making a quick map reconnaissance, looking at where he has to go, the route to be followed, and calculating the time it will take to get there. He then makes his initial time estimate, working backwards from the time at which he must have his position occupied with the key known timing being that of the combat team commander's orders group. 
he takes into consideration the time needed for all battle preparations, including his own orders, as well as time for movement to and preparation of his battle position. One, two, three, the troop leader four, then five, writes six. a warning order, there, which he passes 30. down to his two IC, who then relays it to the crew commanders and directs the appropriate battle preparations. The troop leader arrives at combat team headquarters 15 minutes prior to the orders group to copy the map trace so that his runner can take it to the troop location along with any new information needed by the troop warrant officer to finalize battle preparations. Defend from 312 or 305. The troop is tasked with occupying part of the combat team battle position, as well as with deploying two tanks forward to snipe at the lead elements of the enemy's advance. Once he has his orders, the troop leader makes a more detailed map appreciation, time estimate, and prepares a recce plan. He will likely make changes to his initial warning order. He then conducts a reconnaissance of his assigned defensive position. At the same time, liaison is affected between himself and the local infantry commander to coordinate the positioning of the tanks and the infantry trenches. With his recce completed, the troop leader finalizes his detailed plan, prepares orders, and then delivers them to his crew commanders. In accordance with his battle procedure, the troop leader moves his troop from the harbor into its proposed battle position. He assigns primary and secondary arcs of fire, designates alternate positions, details the marking of turning and reference points, and supervises preparations for defense. Each crew commander prepares a panoramic sketch of his area of responsibility showing potential targets, arcs, and general terrain features. When preparation of the position is completed, the troop leader inspects turret and hull down positions, camouflage, and arcs of fire. The troop then moves into a hide located a short distance from its battle position. The drill for occupying a hide is exactly the same as that for a harbor. A hide, as the name implies, must have concealment, as well as an easy breakout route to the battle position. It is laid out for all round defense. Tanks are well dispersed, and all activity, especially noise, is kept to a minimum. The troop leader conducts a final briefing ensures that all his tanks are ready for battle and that the crews know exactly what they are to do in the coming action. If time allows, the troop is fed and allotted a period of forced rest. If circumstances permit, the squadron practices running up and occupying the battle position. These deployment practices are clocked and the combat team commander is informed to ensure that he is aware of the reaction time required. Before first light, sniping tanks move forward to their positions and the squadron goes on five minutes notice to move. Contact Chris, one, one, eight, five, three, first seven. contact is made. Two T-72s in tree line, a one engaged. Continuing to engage other, over. And the details of enemy location, strength, and activity are passed to Battle Group HQ as the sniping tanks return to their troop location. The squadron moves into its battle position, shuts off engines to reduce thermal signature, and awaits the arrival of the main enemy force. When the firefight begins, weapons engage at maximum ranges, as was specified in the combat team commander's orders. The troop leader's responsibility is to maintain fire discipline. 
In a target-poor environment, the troop leader allocates tanks to engage while others remain turret down. As more and more targets appear, fire is controlled by each crew commander, with the troop leader observing the overall effect. Jockeying between firing positions is vital to the troop survival. The troop leader coordinates this movement to ensure that at least half of his troop is always fighting. As the battle progresses and ammunition is depleted, its redistribution and replenishment become vital tasks. Battle replenishment activity is conducted at a concealed RV behind the troop. The site is set up by the SSM and A1 Echelon at the location directed by the squadron HQ. The tanks move back on order and are resupplied with ammo and fuel. They then return to their positions and carry on with the fight. The attack has been halted and the troop, as part of the combat team, receives a warning order to advance and engage the enemy before he can resume his offensive. Facing north. Call sign a 3-2 facing northeast. Call sign a 3 Bravo authorized to check fire. Golf 4-1 acknowledge over. Radio orders for the advance are given and the combat team moves out. When the troop crosses the line of departure, its formation will be determined by the shape and closeness of the ground, the enemy threat, and by whether the troop is being supported by the rest of the squadron or by other arms anti-armor assets. Possible troop formations include box, in which each tank of the troop makes up one corner of the rectangle. Echelon left, or echelon right, in which the troop is strung out diagonally to the left or right of the lead tank. Staggered column, in which the tanks travel on alternate sides of the same route. Line, normally used in the assault, in which the troop travels abreast of the troop leader's tank. And column, normally used only for administrative moves and negotiating defiles in which tanks travel one behind the other. The troop advances by bounds using the ground, fire and movement and mutual support both within the troop and throughout the squadron and combat team. Caterpillar movement is used when enemy contact is imminent it offers maximum protection since both static and moving forces have time to search the ground before moving. Leapfrog movement is both quicker than caterpillar and riskier as the moving elements do not see the ground they are to cross until they are actually crossing it. Snake movement is used when maneuvering through a long defile without infantry or overwatch elements which requires tanks to provide each other with close support. Contact with the enemy may be made at any time, and the troops' first priority will be to get their tanks into the nearest positions from where they can bring down effective fire. As soon as he is able, the troop leader makes a call for indirect fire to suppress and blind the enemy. Red one four seven six two eight a two one hundred platoon infantry in shell scrapes neutralize ASAP over. When contact is made with anti-tank weapons, they will become a troop target, while any other possible anti-tank weapon positions will be probed with speculative fire. Right flanking. The combat team commander decides to conduct a right flanking with the lead troop acting as fire base. Its task is to provide suppressive and neutralizing fire on the objective while the rest of the combat team moves to its attack position and crosses the line of departure. 
Normally, the troop leader will order a troop shoot to keep the target constantly engaged while also conserving ammunition. As the assault force closes with the enemy, the fire base shifts fire until the infantry commander orders dismount. Fire is then moved to provide flank and depth protection. On the order to dismount, the assaulting tanks slow down, allowing the infantry to close up behind on foot. The troop leader uses his massive weight of fire to shoot his accompanying infantry onto the objective, maintaining the direction of the assault, destroying hard targets, and providing suppressive coaxial machine gun fire. As the infantry begins to consolidate, the troop rolls over to the edge of the objective to form a cordon around the position, protecting the flanks against counterattack, while the infantry take the trenches. Other tank troops may be used to exploit this success by pursuing and destroying any withdrawing enemy. While a formidable grouping in itself, the tank troop will never act alone, but always as part of a larger grouping or all-arms team. There is, therefore, no such thing as tank troop tactics, only skills and drills. Leading a tank troop, however, demands the sort of initiative, enthusiasm, and discipline under fire that characterize the best of junior officers. Mastery of armor skills and the application of sound leadership will be the troop leader's best guarantee of success on the battlefield.